Hello, thank you for joining us for this live Battle of the Atlantic broadcast. I'm Lauren Hessman, Research Coordinator for NOAA's Monitor National Marine Sanctuary, and I'm joined with Joe Hoyt, Maritime Archaeologist for NOAA's Monitor National Marine Sanctuary. We're here in beautiful Ocracoke, North Carolina. Ocracoke is one of the southernmost islands that makes up the Outer Banks of North Carolina. The island's about 16 miles long, and the harbor that you can see behind us is called Silver Lake. It's at the southern end of the island. Ocracoke is truly an island. There are no roads or bridges that connect it to anywhere else. The only way to get on and off is by ferry. So don't be surprised if you see ferries behind us during our broadcast. Travel by ferry is just one of the things that makes this place so special. Another reason why this area is special is because of the rich history and maritime heritage that can be found here. For centuries, the Outer Banks and coastal North Carolina have had a strong connection to the ocean and that relationship has shaped both the people and the place. This connection is exactly what we're gonna focus on today during this broadcast. In fact, NOAA, University of North Carolina Coastal Studies Institute, and other partners have focused on this heritage for the last six years during a project called the Battle of the Atlantic. During this project, scientists known as maritime archeologists actually study shipwrecks. And those shipwrecks remain on the bottom of the ocean, not too far from where we're standing right now. But let's back up. What is the Battle of the Atlantic? Well, off the coast of North Carolina in the Atlantic Ocean is an area known as the Graveyard of the Atlantic. Take a minute after this broadcast and look at a map of North Carolina and you'll be likely to see that area labeled on a map. Um, the Graveyard of the Atlantic was named because of the thousands of shipwrecks that met their untimely demise here. So, like I said earlier, many shipwrecks remain on the bottom of the ocean today. They span hundreds of years of history and they represent nations from all over the world. Some of them sunk, sunk during storms, others ran aground on the shoals that you can find offshore, and there were even others that were lost during the wars that came to coastal North Carolina. The Civil War and World War I both claimed numerous vessels, but not nearly as many as were lost during the Battle of the Atlantic during World War II. Between the years of 1939 and 1945, the Battle of the Atlantic raged off the coast of North Carolina between Axis and Allied vessels. In fact, in 1942, German U-boats sunk so many vessels off the coast of North Carolina that the area was coined Torpedo Junction. So I'm joined by Joe Hoyt, Maritime Archaeologist for NOAA's Monitor National Marine Sanctuary. Thank you for joining us today. Glad to be here. How are you doing? Good. So I've told our viewers a little bit about the history that exists offshore, but I was hoping you could tell us a little bit more about the Battle of the Atlantic and why you and other researchers are interested in learning more about this piece of American history. Absolutely. So the Battle of the Atlantic is a really, uh, it's a really unique aspect of World War II where it actually took place throughout the entirety of the war. Um, and shortly after the United States entered the war in 1941, uh, U-boats were pretty quickly operating off the coast of North Carolina sinking vessels. The point of these, uh, these attacks was to try to cut off the chain of supply uh, to the European theater. So the idea was that the U-boats would come over here and they would sink pr primarily tankers. Oil was sort of the, the lifeblood of the war effort in, in, uh, in Europe. And uh, the belief was if you could if you could cut off that supply chain, you could you could bring the uh, Allied powers to their knees. Uh, and uh, they were actually very successful early on in the war in doing so. So they came over here and they sunk um, between the months of January to July of 1942. They sunk uh, an extraordinary number of vessels all up and down from uh, Nova Scotia all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, but here off Cape Hatteras is really unique because it's uh, it's sort of the confluence of these major oceanic currents. So as a result, we have a really high concentration of shipwrecks right here. That's really important because if you if you look at uh, not only World War II but the, the whole range of maritime history that exists in North Carolina, uh, this is a, a really unique and special place because of the way that the, co the currents are oriented. It's uh, I like to think of it sort of as a uh, uh, one of those moving walkways in an airport. You know, you can use these currents as a navigational aid and as a way to actually pick up a few knots of speed when you're when you're uh, you know running back towards uh, you know north or south, whether you're using the Labrador current coming north to south or the Gulf Stream going south south to north or, or you know that actually takes you straight across the ocean into into England and uh, so this was a really important area uh, from a shipping perspective uh, for hundreds of years and as a result it's sort of this bottleneck um, that was used as a, as a hunting ground for the U-boats in, in World War II. That's amazing. I mean, it's an incredible that that history exists right here, so close to where we're standing right now. And I'm sure that there's a lot of our viewers that were unaware of the fact that the war came so close to, to the American shores in North Carolina. 
Yeah, absolutely. The, uh, you know, one of the reasons that researchers are very interested in this uh, particular engagement is because uh, it is one of the closest places, if not the closest place, that uh, World War II sort of came to the home, home front. Um, you know, of course, there's Pearl Harbor and there were some isolated incidences in, uh, you know, off the coast of uh, the West Coast, but, but there was a, a really uh, concentrated strategic war effort that was really right at our doorstep here. We had vessels that were sinking with inside a shore, uh, the Chesapeake Bay was mined uh, right, you know, right off the shores of Virginia Beach. You know, you find old, you know, old folks down here remember seeing these things happen. They remember seeing billows of smoke over the horizon. Uh, here on Ocracoke Island, we actually have uh, uh, sailors from the HMT Bedfordshire, a British anti-submarine boat that they washed ashore, and they're they're buried here on the island today. You can go visit them at the British Cemetery. So it's a really unique area. It's rich in in, in history and heritage. And uh, one of the things that we're uh, interested in doing through events like this and uh, through the research that we're doing is trying to bring people along with us to tell the story because it's really uh, for as significant as it is it's really an underrepresented piece of our history uh, interestingly you know if you look uh, if you look through uh, historic sites around the country you've got things like the Battle of Little Bighorn or uh, Gettysburg all these things that are sort of these iconic uh, events that shaped our, our history we remember them we we as a as a nation we uh, celebrate those things we establish parks and monuments and and we remember those places where important things happen you know the ocean is is a lot more inaccessible it's a lot diff more difficult to do work it's a lot more difficult to share and see and, and bring people to it but thanks to modern technology and advanced uh, diving and remote sensing technology we're really kind of for the first time able to tell this story in a way that says look this is this is just as significant to our national story as, as these other these other sites and trying to trying to package that and present it is, is a challenge but that's that's kind of what we're all about here I think that's great I would love to show our viewers a little bit more about how you conduct that oceanographic research and collect that data but I think probably the best way to do that is to show our viewers for themselves right come aboard let's go Hi, welcome aboard NOAA's research vessel RV8501. I'm joined down here in the dive well with Tane Casterly, maritime archaeologist from NOAA's Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Hi, Tane. Hi, nice to be here. So I was hoping, as a maritime archaeologist, I see you're standing next to some scuba gear. I was hoping that you would tell myself and our viewers a little bit about how you use scuba diving to do your job. Yeah, well, we use a variety of gear to uh, image wrecks on the bottom, so how to see them. But the way we can best do it is to get right down there with them. So we use scuba gear. So this is an open circuit rig that we use for decompression diving. We got two giant tanks in the back we have with our breathing gases, two regulators backed up for safety, a bladder here to keep us buoyant, and then we have reels right like this and lift bags that we use to uh, signal that we're coming on up on our way ascending to the surface. That's great. So I know you guys scuba dive and sometimes you scuba dive on really deep wrecks, but it's my understanding you don't really have a line that connects the vessel all the way down to the shipwreck that you're diving on, right? So how in the world do you do you find yourself on that shipwreck on the bottom of the ocean? All right. Well, that, that's great. So the foremost thing is that we don't want to damage the shipwrecks. So um, uh, there's been a practice in the past where people might anchor on them. We don't want to do that. We don't want to put the pressure of the boat tearing up that resource. So what we do is actually we have a small light anchor attached to a line and a big uh, float or ball on the surface. And we actually toss it over the side of the boat when we're above the wreck. That catches on and then the float comes up to the surface so it's attached to the wreck. So again, we don't want to actually impact the wreck's uh, side at all. So we'll do something called live boating. So what we'll do is back down on the boat. We'll have all the divers standing right where we are right here, and they'll jump in on that float and go down that line. And that way, uh, they can get to the site safely, but again, they're not only pulling or tugging on that wreck. That's really fascinating. So, I was hoping, actually, we have a student on board with us who would uh, try on this gear and tell us what it's like to, to try to strap it on. So, I'm here with Mike Adams. He's uh, a member of the Monitor National Marine Sanctuary Youth Working Group. Hi, Mike. Hey. So I know you're a scuba diver, right? Uh, yes, I do some recreational diving. Okay, well great. So I'm curious if you would sit down and strap this gear on and tell us, tell us what it feels like. Let's see if you can stand up with all that weight. All right. Oh, come on. Use there those muscles. Yeah. <laughs> so what did that feel like? It's much heavier than a recreational uh, unit. Have you ever dove with two, tank two tanks before? I have not. Okay, so you got some uh, extra things to learn, you know, as far as a scuba diver, right? Yes, for sure. Great. Well, thanks for trying that on uh, for us. It looked pretty hard to get up with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that
that heavy bang too when he sits down. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much, Tane and Mike. I'm going to move over here and we're going to talk with a different representative who's been on the Battle of the Atlantic expedition. So now I'm joined by Jason Nunn, who's dive safety officer from East Carolina University. So Jason, we just talked about some scuba gear over on the other side of the dive well. Right here, this looks nothing like the typical cylinder and buoyancy control device that I'm used to seeing. What in the world are we looking at? That's right, Lauren. These are what we refer to as closed circuit rebreathers. Uh, just like the dual setup that we have over there, these also have two tanks, but you can see that they're significantly smaller. So what happens with the closed circuit rebreather is uh, the diver will breathe in on one side, it follows this line all the way over into another set of counter lungs just like these and into a scrubber canister. What happens there is it recycles the air that you breathe and puts out and it cleans out all the impurities and it allows you to keep breathing the same air that you've used. Um, it's a lot more efficient means and for expeditions like this it gives us a lot more flexibility in where we can go and what we can do. So flexibility, um, can you talk more specifically about that? I mean, can you go deeper? Or what, what specifically are the benefits of using a rebreather? Well, again, as you can see, it requires a lot less gas in the loop. So that means that there's less equipment that we have to cart around, there's less time filling tanks, those kinds of things. Also because what it does is it has a, it gives you the best mix for the depth that you're at. You don't always have to keep adjusting it at the surface, it does that automatically through your computer. That's really interesting. So in theory you could dive deeper depths for longer because you're basically recycling your own gas, correct? That's exactly right. That is really interesting. So Mike, can we get you to come out here again? Why don't you strap on this rebreather unit and tell us how this one, how this feels. All right. All right, let's see. Wow, what did that feel like? Oh, that was much lighter. So significantly lighter, so that's probably another benefit too. Not only can you stay deeper for longer, but it's also less gear, which makes it a lot easier to, to use. Are you rebreather certified? I am not. Okay, so just another certification that you can work towards, right? Yes. All right, well, thank you both, uh, and uh, let's see what else the boat has to offer. So here we are a couple steps up from the dive well on the back deck of the RV8501. Now as you can see, I told you there's a North Carolina ferry in the background. Um, there's more equipment up here on the back deck and I'm joined by Joe Hoyt again who's going to talk a little bit about this piece of equipment that we see right here. So Lauren, what this is, this is a, it's called a side scan sonar system. This is one of the tools that we use to actually, uh, we do a number of things with it. One of the things is we'll actually look for new shipwrecks. Uh, this allows us uh, to image the seabed uh, remotely and uh, what it does is it sends out uh, sound waves. There's a couple different frequencies that you can set it at and uh, it sends out an, uh, a sound pulse. It, hits an object like the seabed or a shipwreck and it sends a return signal to the fish which is recorded and uh, that gives you an actual almost like a photographic image of what the seafloor looks like. Uh, so the two applications that we use it in, in our research is one is finding new shipwrecks. We actually found a new shipwreck in about 230 feet of water uh, that we got an image of. We're not quite sure what it is but you can see a lot of distinct features on it. It's enough that you can tell it's a shipwreck but it uh, allows you to measure it, get length and beam and, uh, and be able to determine a little bit about what sort of the engines might be like. You can see a few boilers. Um, the other thing that we'll do with it is we'll go to wrecks that we already know about and uh, that are either uh, difficult to see because you have limited visibility, you can't see the entire wreck uh, all at once with a diver. This gives you an overall uh, sort of plan image of what the site's dis distribution is like. So we crank that up to high frequency and we get a really good detailed image. We've done that um, uh, this summer on sites like the FW Abrams and you can see really distinctly all three boilers, the engine space and totally how the, uh, the whole ship is oriented on the seabed. Uh, we also got a really good image of the USS Tarpon, it's a uh, US submarine that sunk off the coast here. Uh, so this is a really valuable tool, it allows us to get a lot, of, uh, a lot of imagery of the seabed without putting divers in the water. It can actually help the divers that do go in to sort of know where they're at, navigate around, and, uh, but it becomes a, a data set that's valuable in its own right. That's great. So we did talk about scuba diving earlier and obviously the human body can only go to a certain depth, but this piece of equipment, I imagine it can go a lot deeper. Can you tell us a little bit about that? 
Yeah, so we use a we use a variety of different uh, types of technologies to, to image sites that are deeper than uh, divers can get. This site's really the only limitation on it for us is the uh, length of cable that we have. We actually drag this behind the vessel. Uh, and we're, for instance, when we're searching for new shipwrecks, we, we do what we call mowing the lawn. Uh, we'll find an area that we think a shipwreck may be, and uh, we'll actually just go back and forth, up and down, and it'll create this you know this image that we can stitch together of the seabed. Um, and that, we're limited to about a thousand feet of water with this system that we have. The fish can actually go a little bit deeper than that. But uh, these can also, this sort of same technology can be installed on uh, ROVs or AUVs and it can, it can really go a lot deeper than divers can get. So it's a, it's a really valuable tool for that, for that purpose. Well, that's great. So we've learned about two different tools, scuba diving, remote sensing equipment that these maritime archaeologists use to put all these pieces together. Let's actually walk inside the dry lab and see what else we can find in there. It is a hot day here in North Carolina in Ocracoke, and I'm happy to be inside right now. We're in the dry lab. There's more equipment in here. So we've talked a little bit about scuba diving. We've talked a little bit about remote sensing equipment. So I'm now joined by John McCord, Education Programs Coordinator for UNC's Coastal Studies Institute. Hi, John. Hi. So we're going to talk about all this equipment that you see in the dry lab behind me, cameras and video cameras. Um, I'm going to let John tell you how he uses that equipment to collect information on the shipwrecks that he dives on. Thanks, Lauren. One of the things that the archaeologists use quite regularly is imaging equipment to be able to gather as much data as they can on the shipwrecks. One of the challenges with diving is we have very limited time on the bottom and equipment such as these cameras that you see here allow us to gather valuable data that we can then go uh, back through and gain more information about the shipwrecks and uh, by looking at that data back here in the lab. We have some still camera equipment like th that you see here, which is great for taking photos of the wrecks, of the state of the wreck. It's also great for doing something called a photo mosaic, which is actually a series of photos that allow us to get a picture of the wreck once we stitch them all together, all in sequence. Well, you also use a, a variety of, um, of high-end video equipment. This particular camera is called a Red uh, Epic Digital Cinema Camera. Camera, and this shoots in what's called 5K resolution. Typical high definition resolution is 1080p, and this is almost five times that resolution. So one question might be, why do we need a camera that has that much resolution? And the, the, the answer is, is that with that limited amount of bottom time that we get on site, this gives us an, an opportunity to get as much data as we can and be able to review it later in the lab or right here in the science lab here on the NOAA SRVX. We put together a short little piece uh, on the wrecks of some of the sites that we visited both this year and in years past, and so we're going to go to that now.
So John, these are pretty good sized cameras. Can you tell us how heavy are these things? These, you're right, Lauren, these cameras are pretty big. In fact, this particular camera weighs about 65 pounds fully rigged out, which is a lot on land, but we have it trimmed out. You can see with little weights and there's a large amount of, a large volume of air in there that we have it trimmed out so that it's what is called neutrally buoyant. So if I let go of it underwater, it basically just kind of floats there in space. So while these things weigh a lot and they're difficult to get into the water and out of the water, under the water, they're really a joy to shoot with. All right, there's some pretty fascinating stuff aboard this research vessel. While this is great, let's go learn a, bit, a little bit about how this vessel is maneuvered. All right, so we've walked upstairs. We're now on the bridge of the RV 8501, and I'm joined by Captain Pasquale de Rosa from Cardinal Point Captains. So I know that this research vessel is 85 feet, and we've learned a lot about how these maritime archaeologists collect information off of the shipwrecks, but really, how do you even navigate a ship this size and find those shipwrecks? It really seems like a little bit like finding a needle in a haystack. Well, it can be. Um... Talking with, you spoke with Joe Hoyt earlier, and uh, over the years we've been gathering information on wrecks all over this area. Uh, so we have a lot of numbers and we have reliable locations of a lot of these wrecks. Um, we talked about the towfish earlier and how, you know, in between doing dives on wrecks that we actually know where they are, um, we're searching for new wrecks all the time. But the wrecks that we do know where they are, we have latitudes and longitudes for those. So that's a series of numbers that gives you a geographic position of where those wrecks are in the ocean. So what I do with those numbers is I'll put them into our navigation system here. And if you look up here on the screen, each one of these sites are all wrecks that are pertinent to Battle of the Atlantic. This entire area off the coast of the Outer Banks is littered with thousands of wrecks. But these wrecks that you're seeing here are all pertinent to what we're, pertinent to what we're doing out here with the Battle of the Atlantic, World War II specific wrecks. Um, so we covered quite a bit of these, I'd say, over half this trip and over the past years we've been to almost all of them. So about how far offshore are you traveling on any at any given time um, and about how long does it take to get there? Well some of the furthest wrecks we're going to uh, offshore no more than 40 miles uh, but out of away from port depending on where we're running from you know we'll travel up to 100 miles to go to some of these sites. What we typically try to do is go to the furthest site and work our way back in so we can hit a multiple amount of sites in one outing. So we'll go out, stay out for a few days, dive during the day, side scan at night, and do that for maybe three or four days, and then come back in to reprovision and do it all over again. So an expedition like this takes a lot of planning, because I know you do. You try to stay offshore as long as you can so you can get as much data collected as you can while you're offshore, right? Yes, definitely. Great. I'd like to thank all the organizations that made this live broadcast possible. NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, UNC Coastal Studies Institute, East Carolina University, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, the National Park Service, and North Carolina Center for the Advancement of Teaching. I'd also like to thank all of you for joining us. I hope you learned a little bit about America's hidden treasures located off the coast of North Carolina in the graveyard of the Atlantic. I also hope that you'll join us for future live broadcasts.